Let's pray the prayer for the illumination. O Lord, our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> Today's reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not loved, I am only a resounding gong <clears throat> or a clenching cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can phantom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not loved, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not loved, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I taught like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, do uh, take out your sermon notes with me as we prepare to uh, listen to God's Word. We have come to the end of our series, uh, but before we go into the Word, let us have a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And Lord, this morning we ask once again for your Spirit to come and speak to us, for your Spirit to come and minister to us. Lord, speak your words directly into our hearts and may your word bear fruit in our lives and may your word transform our hearts in Jesus' name we pray amen amen all right so we have come to the end of our series we've been going through i think almost six weeks of this negators series and in this series we basically talk about the attitudes or the uh, the, the things that the attitudes that we have which basically negates the work of God in our lives. You know, we want to grow. We want to be more Christ-like. We want to grow deeper in God. We want to grow more matured. But for some reason, because of the attitudes in our life, the negative attitudes in our life, it negates all those work of the Spirit in our lives. And today, we want to come to the final uh, negator that we're going to talk about, which is uh, one of the most critical and the one that, 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 that uh, determines the most our condition in God. And basically, it talks about our motives. What is our motive? What is your motive? What's your motive in serving, in worshipping, in becoming a Christian? What is your motives? You know, the more I study the Word of God, the more I grow in my walk with God, the, the more I, I, I look at the Word of God, increasingly I realise that our God is never a God of the external. 
Our God is not a God of the external. He's not a God that looks so much at the outward acts, but He's a God of the internal, a God that looks at the heart, that looks at what is inside of us and look at our attitudes, our mindset, the way we perceive things. Our God is a God of, an inter- of the eternal. That's why Romans 2.28 says this, For He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is, is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from man, but from God. You see, friends, God is a God of the internal. God is a God that is con- gets concerned about the conditions of our hearts, not so much our outward actions but the conditions of our hearts. You see, friends, what matters most, most with God is the motives behind the things we do. Not just the things we do, but the motives behind the things we do. That's why First Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord does not see as a man sees, for, the Lord looks, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's the heart, friends, that matters most to the Lord. And in many cases, you read the Bible, there's many cases of people doing right things with the wrong motives. There are many cases of people which they do, they do the right things, but yet with the wrong motives and they were condemned. For example, Ananias and Sapphira, what did they do? They did right, you know, they actually sold a piece of land and they gave the money to the church. I mean, how many of you would do that? Okay, fine, they gave half, big deal. How many of you would sell a house and give half of it to the church? But they did something that was right. They gave their offerings to the Lord. But for a reason, they were condemned because their motives were not right. They wanted, they wanted to be praised. They did it for ulterior motives, not because they wanted to give. And because of that, they were condemned. Another example, the seven sons of Sceva. You know, they were out, they were, they were performing deliverance on people, setting people free from demonic activity, and they were doing the right things. But yet, because their motives was not right, God was not with them, and they were overpowered by the demons. Another example is Simon, uh, not the Simon Peter, but the other Simon, that when Peter, they all went to this town, there was this Simon who was a sorcerer, and he saw that when Peter laid hand on on people, they received the Holy Spirit. And Simon said, I want that gift, I also want that, which is the right thing, you want it. You want to have the Holy Spirit in your life? You want to have the power to impart the Holy Spirit to people? That is the right thing. But yet, he did it with an impure motives because he wanted to advance his magic show or advance his status. He did it with an ulterior motives. And so, friends, you see, we should write I mean, the first point in your notes here is that wrong motives doesn't make right actions right. You get it? Wrong motives, in God's eyes, in the world it may be different, But in God's eyes, wrong motives will never make a right action right. That as long as you can be doing all the right things, you can be doing all the things that are required of you. You may be you may be coming to worship God, you may be tithing, you may be giving, you may be doing all the right things. But if you are doing all the right things with the wrong motives, those right actions doesn't become right. It doesn't work. Because in God's eyes, what he looks at the heart. You see, because it's, it, why is this so important? Because the source of what we do will determine the quality of our actions. The source from what we do. You know, the source is very important. If it comes from a wrong source, whatever actions, it may be the right actions, but yet the quality of that actions or the results of the action will never be what is pleasing to God. It will always be contaminated. You know, it's like this. If you remember, I think about somewhere last year, Selangor. I'm from Selangor, so I, I like to talk about Selangor. You know, in, in, in Selangor is in the, in the news, in top of the news nowadays. Okay? In Selangor, I think about one year back, suddenly they had to close down four or three water treatment plants. Why? Because some, some, and they discovered way up in upstream river, of the river, Sungai Selangor, someone spilled diesel into the river. And because diesel was spilled into the river, downstream, Hundreds of miles downstream, four or three or four water plants were all shut down because of what was because of the spill of diesel. And you see, what happens is this: you know, it's like because regardless of what the water treatment plants were doing, you know, they were doing all the right things. They were doing all the right process. There was no fault of the water treatment plants at all. They were doing everything right. 
but because the source of water was contaminated. Whatever right processes they did on it, it cannot cleanse the water because the source was overly contaminated. And because of that, I don't know, half, half of Selengo had to suffer, half of the Klang Valley had to suffer with no water again. And likewise in our lives. You know, you may think that my actions is all that's important, but if the source from which our actions flows out is not right, it contaminates everything we do. And that explains why sometimes, you know, God will look at one person and say, you know, you are pleasing in my sight, and another person, you are not, even though both may be doing the same thing. A very good example is Cain and Abel. Both came before God, both gave an offering before God, and both offering was, was, I mean, was right. Both their offerings were proper offerings, and they came and they gave it. But for some reason, God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's. Why? If I look at the scriptures, I believe with all my heart, it's because one came with the right motives, and the other came with a wrong motive. And that's why the Bible says in Matthew 12, 34, it says here, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Not just about the mouth, but basically about your actions. It's out of the abundance of our hearts, what's inside of us, the source in us, that flows out all our actions, our words, our acts, everything we do, comes from the abundance of our hearts. If our hearts, if the source is contaminated, if the source is not right, everything that we do in the eyes of God will neither be right. That's just how it is. Why do you come to church? Why do we worship? Why do we serve? Well, there are many reasons. Some, one, one reason why many of us do that is we are motivated, you should write me the next point in your note, is we are motivated by fear. We are motivated by fear. Fear of punishment, fear of judgment. You know, if I don't follow God, if I don't worship Him, I, uh, I go to hell afterward, la, so salo. You know, because it's fear of punishment. Or God may be unhappy with me, or God may punish me and God may strike me dead, or God may put a curse upon me, so I better be a good Christian and I come to church and I worship Him. You know, and some churches, they do that, you know. Some churches, they actually instill fear in people. You know, you, you go to some churches, the pastor will always be condemning. You don't do this or else you, the wrath of God will be upon you. If you do this, the wrath of God will be on you and God will strike you dead. If you do this, do this, do this, you will go to hell. And then they teach such fear that, you know, that if you are found doing something that is not right, if you happen to be watching something that is not right at a particular time and you die at that moment, imagine where you will end up. Hell. And fear instills fear in the lives of people. And, and, you know, some churches are like that. Some people, you know, and some people, they follow God because of fear. Because of fear. You know, it reminds me of a story of these two brothers. You know, there were two brothers who were terrible troublemakers. And they were always breaking things, stealing things, lying, making all kinds of trouble. And the parents have tried everything to get the boys to change, but to no avail. Finally, out of options, they went to ask their, pre, their pastor if he can help. He says, well, okay, I'll talk to the boys, but I'll talk to them one at a time. So the parents dropped the youngest boy in the church, to, uh, in the church and they went home. They said they'll come and pick the boy up once the uh, session is over. So the boy came to the pastor's office, sat at the chair across the pastor's desk, and the pastor just looked at him. And after a while, the pastor would ask him, son, where is God? The boy just sits there and doesn't answer. Pastor begins to look more sternly and say, in a loud voice, son, where is God? And at that moment, to the pastor's surprise, the boy jumped out of his seat and ran out of the church, ran all the way home, ran back into the house, locked the door, ran up to the brother's room, locked the door and closed there and looked at the brother and said, we are in big trouble. What happened? See, they have lost God and they think we, we have something to do with it. Sometimes that's what fear does. You know, sometimes we do things out of fear. See, the problem is, if we are motivated by fear, then the tendency is, we will just do the bare minimum. We will do the bare minimum. Just to avoid punishment. Just to avoid consequences, we will do the bare minimum that I can get, I can get away with. What is the least? Okay, I come to church on Sunday. Okay, that's the least. Okay, not, not, not only, only one and a half hours, or not two hours, that's the least I will do. If service ends late a bit, I will go back early, that's the least. 
What else? What else? What else? The least. Okay, I must give money to the offering. Okay, fine. What's the least I need to give? Five dollars? One dollar? Ten dollar? Okay, that's the least. And we will just do the bare minimum because that's all we are interested in: getting out of punishment, avoiding consequences. Let me, let me give you an example. Let's say you're driving on the plus highway, and you and the speed limit is 110. If you fear getting a summon, if you fear getting fined by the traffic police. What will you do? You will drive 110, right? That's the bare minimum. But it's okay, lah. Bare, sometimes we know, you know, their camera radar got tolerance of plus minus 10, right? So we can drive until 120, we should still be safe. But that's the bare minimum. It's not because we love the law, it's not because we respect the law, not because we are such, such law abiding citizens, but because we fear getting summoned. So if it's plus minus 10, we can avoid, we drive at 120, never mind, still safe. And better still, when it comes to holiday season, Hari Raya or Chinese New Year, and you have to travel, you know, I had a church member once, he, he got inside information and he can give, he'll give me a list of where all the police roadblocks are, where all the traffic police set up cameras, every spot. He'll tell you which kilometer, which kilometer, which kilometer. And all you need to do is bring that list along. And as long as you drive according to that list, comes to that area, slow down, 110. After you finish that area, 150 again. Then when you come to the next area, slow down, 110. That's what we do, right? If it is just because of fear of being summoned, fear of getting a fine, because we will just do the bare minimum. And that's why, friends, fear, listen to this comment, fear will change your immediate actions, but it will not change your heart. Fear will change your immediate actions, but it will never change your heart. You're just as rebellious as ever. You just hate the thing as much as ever. It never changes your heart. Let me just tell you a very uh, emb embarrassing thing. You know, when I was young, maybe when I was primary school or kindergarten, around six, seven, eight, around that age. You know, as children, sometimes you don't, don't like to do certain things just because your parents ask you to do it. And one of the things that I never liked doing was to brush my teeth. I hate brushing my teeth. After all, think of it logically. Your milk teeth is going to be gone and you will be destroyed anyway, right? So why do you need to brush your milk teeth and take care of your milk teeth? After all, it's going to be destroyed. You're going to have a new teeth. That's the, that's the one you need to take care of. The milk teeth you don't have to take care of, right? But mothers being mothers, they never listen to your argument. They don't think logically. Mothers never think logically. So my mom would be very strict and say, nope, you must brush your teeth every night and neck and everything. And so, okay, out of fear of that, fine, I will brush my teeth. So I'll go into the toilet every day, I will lock the door in the toilet, and I will do all sorts of, I'll spend 5 minutes, 10 minutes, how long does it take to brush your teeth? I'll spend that minute, I will squeeze the toothpaste out and wash it down the sink, I will wet my toothbrush and wet my cup so that it looks like it was used, I will even take my toothbrush and press, 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 rub, 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 rub it to see that it's been being rubbed, being, rub, being used. I will do all sorts of things to give the appearance as though I have brushed my teeth, but I did not brush my teeth at all. I will even gargle, gargle just to make sure there's no dirt and everything. Clean it and do all sorts of things. And you see, that's what it does. Okay, don't worry, I brush my teeth nowadays, alright? Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but the fact is, when it is fear that drives you, you will do something, yes, but it won't change your heart. You still hate it, you still dislike it, you still despise it, but because of fear, you still do it. And likewise in us, many of us, we come to God out of fear. And because of fear, we just do the things that we have to do. But our hearts are far from God. That's one group of people. The other group of people, they come to church and what they say? They are motivated by rewards. We should write my next, next point. They are motivated by rewards. They don't really live in a society that says, what do I get out of it? What can I get out of it? You know, every time we ask you for something, you know, what can I get out of it? You know, that becomes a culture for us today. Even my daughter, you know, I, I, it's my fault. Like, I've been training her from a young age. You know, we always talk about the carrot or the stick. And we've been training her, training her in such a way that, you know, a lot of times we come, what do I get? You know, even at this young age. You know, for example, she likes to eat uh, KFC, McDonald's. She likes to eat fried chicken. 
And uh, in those days when she was very young, she didn't like to eat anything. And so we had to find something that she would eat. And she seems to have an inclination towards fried chicken. And so I began to uh, bribe her that, you know, every time you eat the fried chicken, she likes the chicken skin, by the way. I'll say it's after you have eaten five pieces of five, I mean, I'll break the chicken a smaller, a bit of this, I will give you one small piece of skin. You eat a bit more, you'll get another small piece of skin. And that's not enough. After a while, she wants more reward. So I have to sit there and I have to tell her stories while she eat. That was when she was like four years old or five years old, you know. You have to tell stories and she will eat. And the problem is until today, she still requires me telling her story whenever she goes to eat McDonald's or KFC. Otherwise, she won't eat. And, and I realized one thing. The, when I tell her a story, and, I can, and if I tell a very short story, the minute the story finish, oh, I'm full already, daddy, and the plate is still there, a lot of chicken there, I'm full already. But the days when I tell an extra long story, I can even peel almost three pieces of chicken and she will still eat it finish if I go for an extra long story. I mean, come and think of it. It is for her own benefit to eat, right? It's not for me. But yet, because she does it out of rewards. You want me to eat? I need something. I need to get something. I want rewards. And sometimes for us, that's our motives. When we come to God, I want something. If I don't get something out of it, why should I come? Why do I need to come? Why do I need to worship? I want to get something. And the danger of this is this. The danger of seeking God because of rewards is that when the rewards don't come, when you expect a healing and it doesn't come, you expect a promotion and it doesn't come, you expect your wife to change and she doesn't change, you expect something and it doesn't happen, what happens is the tendency is, ah, I'm going to give, I'm going to, I forget about God. I'm not, I'm not, I, don't, I don't trust Him anymore. I don't follow. I don't believe Him anymore. And we stop following Him. We stop, we stop following Him all the way. We may still be in church, but we no longer stop because we, we no longer follow because we don't get what we want. And our heart's passion, our excitement for God is no longer there. Another story is told of this boy. You know, he desperately wanted a red bicycle for Christmas. And he was thinking, his parents say, well, why not you pray to God and see whether you can get it or not? He said, okay, fine. And so he began praying. He prayed, Jesus, please give me a bicycle, a red bicycle. And I promise you, if you give me a red bicycle, I won't fight with my brother for a year. Then after a while, he said, wait, 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 wait. Cannot, 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 cannot. The, my brother is so bad, I sure will fight with him. He irritates me too much. I sure cannot keep that promise. Wait, let me think about it. Huh? Okay, okay, Jesus, Jesus. If you give me a red bicycle for Christmas, I promise I will eat all my vegetables for a year. Hey, wait, 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 no, no. You have to eat Brussels sprouts and I cannot, 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 cannot. spinach some more. No, 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 no. I don't think I can keep that promise. After a while, he, after a while thinking and thinking, thinking, suddenly he got a bright idea. He ran downstairs. He ran all the way to the nearest church. He went to the altar of the church and he took the statue of Virgin Mary. And he ran back up to the house hide the statue, put it in a box, hide it in his cupboard, and he came to Jesus and said, Dear Jesus, I, if you want to see your mother again, give me a red bicycle. <laughs> That's what happens when we are motivated by rewards. God, if I don't get this anymore, nah, I don't think I want to do this anymore for you. I don't think I want to, oh yeah, I'll still come to church, but... I won't go the extra mile anymore. I won't serve in that ministry anymore. I won't do this anymore because I just don't get what I want. Let me ask you this question, friends. And I've asked this question to different congregations before. If there is no reward of heaven and there is no penalty of hell, will you still follow Jesus? Think about it carefully. If there is no reward of heaven and there is no penalty of hell, how many of us will still say we will follow Jesus? Let's be honest. How many of us would really follow Jesus? You can't. If you are motivated by rewards, no. If you are motivated by fear, the answer will be no. But if you can, if you are motivated by the third reason, which you should write me your notes, is sometimes we need to be motivated by fear, love. We need to be motivated.
by love. And that, my friends, is the highest motivation. But what is love today, you know? Love is such a vague word today. My wife would come at me and say, Oh, honey, I love you so much. And the next day, he would say, Oh, I love chocolates as well. I mean, what is love? Am, am, I, am I equal to chocolates or is chocolate as great as me? You know, I don't know. What, you know? What, is, what is love today? We use the word so fluidly today. You know, it's just interesting you can hear some, what some children say about love. Uh, if you want to just hear what children say about love, a group of professionals, they post these questions to four and eight years old. And this is what they get. They ask them, what is love? They will say, love, Chrissy, age six, says this. Love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your French fries without making them give you any of the ass. And that is love. Or <clears throat> Chris, age seven, says, love is when mommy, dad, mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Robert Redford. <laughs> Lauren, age four, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> Bethany, age four, I let my big sister pick on me because my mom says she only picks on me because she loves me. So I pick on my baby sister because I love her too. <laughs> Karen, age seven, when you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars start coming out from you. This is what children think about love. But what is love today? You see, friends, love has many qualities today. Because of the spread of love, has many qualities. And then Philippians 1 9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. You, God, Paul's prayer is that your love may abound. Because, you see, he knows, he realized that loves have different levels of quality. You can love something, you can love chocolate, you can love peanut butter, you can love cakes, but there is a different quality of love. And that's why Paul says, you know, may your love increase. You see, love is like any other product in this world. There are different qualities of it. You can buy a cheap imitation off the shelf or you can buy something that is really high-end and really good quality product. Very good example is a while ago, somewhere sometime last year, uh, someone blessed my family with an iPad, you know, this mini iPad. And so we started letting, so the ch- family was happy, the children were happy, they get to play and everything. But I began realizing my son was very rough. You know, he playing iPad, be, and for me, it's like, it'll spoil in no time. So I say, okay, fine, no. We won't let them, we won't let the children play with that. And he's not the youngest boy. What we will do is I went out to Dataran Palawan and I bought the cheap, you know, the Malaysian brand iPad from China that only costs 100 ringgit, 150 ringgit. That's all it costs, 150 ringgit. They call it iPad or IPED or something like that. I don't know what it's called. 150 ringgit. So I bought that instead. A normal iPad is about 1,000 ringgit. So I bought a 150 ringgit iPad. Brought it home and let, let, my, let, let him bang on it. And I tell you, within three months or four months, the, touch, the screen no longer functions as well. It's still usable, but you can see all the defects coming out already within three months. And that is what, that's the difference between a high-end quality product and a cheap imitation. Likewise with our love. Sometimes our love is also like that. There's a high-end quality love and there's also a cheap imitation love. Question is, what love do you have for God? And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 31, he says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become like a sounding brass. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and although I have faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. In other words, what Paul says that if there's no love, if our hearts are not motivated by love, whatever that we have done, all that we have, is nothing. Because we need to be motivated by love. And not just any love, but a high quality love. What's a high-quality love? Well, would you write me the next point in your notes? A high-quality love transforms fears to reverence. It transforms fear to reverence. You see, fear is a... You see, when you read the Bible, you get very confused, you know. Certain parts of the Bible says, you know, like for instance, 1 John 4, 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love 
cast out fear because fear involves torment. You know, there's no fear in love. Proverbs 9, 10 on the other hand says, fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So what is this? Should we fear or should we not fear? The Bible says fear and the Bible says don't fear. You know, what, what is it? Well, as I look at this, I begin to realize that just like love, there's also qualities of fear. There is a fear that can be very unhealthy and there's a fear that can be very healthy. A very unhealthy fear causes us to run away from a person, causes us to avoid that thing, causes us to skip it at arm's length. It's like, like phobias. You know phobias? You know what are phobias? You know phobias are things that we want to keep away at arm's length, and these are unhealthy kind of fears. Well, speaking about phobia, let me give you the top 10 weird phobias in this world. Top 10 weird phobias by Miriam Webster. It says this, number one, how many, see how many of you know this phobias? Hepaphobia, the fear of being touched. Number two, Dorophobia, fear of touching the skin or fur of an animal. Eremophobia, fear of being alone. Ergophobia, I wonder how many of us have this, fear of work. Hypnophobia, any idea? Hypnophobia, fear of sleeping. Brontophobia, I think my children have this. It is called fear of thunder. Kakorafophobia, fear of failure. Any perfectionists around here? That is, that you have that. Ophidiophobia, fear of snakes. Tephiphobia, fear of being buried alive. But the best of all that I found is what they call phobophobia. You know what's phobophobia? The fear of having a phobia. The phobia of getting a phobia. I mean, this is ridiculous. They have, a, they have a phobia for everything. In fact, you are sitting right here now. If you are scared of Chinese people, what does it call? Anybody knows? Xenophobia. You are just scared of Chinese people. And don't, don't, don't think about the Chinese. If you are scared of Indian people, this is, it takes an Indian to pronounce this. It's called Mikatiko Indica Phobia. <laughs> And I also like the last one the best. If you are scared of everything, it's called panphobia. You're just scared of everything, panphobia. See, there is a phobia for everything. And, but you see, like, like phobias, what does phobia do? When we have a phobia of something, you run away from it, right? My wife is scared of lizards. She will run, run helter-skelter when she sees a lizard. My children follows after her, and so they also run helter-skelter when they see a lizard. And there's a phobia, it's negative. But a healthy phobia, in other words, is one that, that produces reverence and respect. That produces, you know, you see, in the Old Testament, the people followed God because God says, you know, if you don't fear me, you will die. And basically that's what happened. If you disobey God, you die. That's the Old Testament. And, you know, but God is not asking them to be afraid of Him. What God is asking is for them to fear Him, but a healthy kind of fear that leads to reverence and respect. And I never really understood this until I heard an example given by one pastor. And he gave this example of, you know, electricity. You know, uh, recently if you read the newspapers here and there, you will find many cases where people get electrocuted and die. Right? We always hear a lot of stories of that. People will climb the wire, touch the wire, bzz, they're dead. And you, if you realize, you know, the amount of wattage the, el the electricity will bring from place to place is in kilowatts, thousands of voltage. And that amount of voltage, with, you know, when you touch that amount of voltage, it will, bzz, you will, you will zap you dead, fly, flies, flies you off the ground. But that same amount of voltage and voltage can also light up streets light up cities. That amount of wattage will keep cities warm, keeps people warm, make lives so much better. And you see, there's much power in electricity. But if we give it the respect in handling it, not to say we chin chai chin chai handling it, but we handle it with respect, then it serves us, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is something good. But when we handle it laxatically, you know, when we take, when we take it for granted, and we just, uh, you know, mistreat electricity, it will kill you. Likewise with God. You know, when we have a high quality of love, you won't have an unhealthy fear of God. 
But what you will have is a sense of respect and reverence, where you will respect God for the, for the person He is, for the power that He has. And that kind of respect brings you closer. It's the beginning of wisdom. That's why the Bible says, fear the Lord. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, if you don't fear the Lord, you become dumber and dumber each day. But if you fear the Lord, you become wiser and wiser each day. Very quickly, the next thing, a high, next point in your notes is that a high quality love does not seek reward, but is always grateful. A high quality love does not seek reward, but is always grateful. First Corinthians 13 5. Love does not seek its own. Love does not seek its own. Love does not seek its own needs. Does not seek its own welfare. Does not seek its own desire. Love never seeks its own, but it's always grateful. You see, friends, when you understand the fullness of what God has done for us, the forgiveness that God has brought for us, you would then result in true gratitude. Not a seeking for reward, but a true gratitude for Him. Let me tell you, it's like this. You see, God has forgiven us for our sins, right? How many of you believe that God has forgiven you for all your past sins? Raise your hands. Yes, praise the Lord. How many of you believe that God has already forgiven you for all your future sins? Raise your hands. That's a bit, we have a question mark there now. You see, let me, let, let, let me, let, let's rewind that thing. 2,000 years ago on Calvary, Jesus laid there and died, right? Did Jesus die for some of your sins or for all of your sins when he was there on the cross? He died for all your sins. And how many of that sins have you already committed 2,000 years ago? You're not even born yet, right? None. And so if in, at 2,000 years ago, Christ already died for all our sins, fast forward the tape now to today. Christ has died, died for your past sins, yes. Has he died for your future sins as well? Yes. He's already died for them. He's already paid the price for them. And so when you realize that Christ has died for your sins, even for the sins of my future, you mean even for the sins that I would like to do? Even for the things that I may want to do tomorrow? You've already died for it? Yay! I can go and do it now! Is that our reaction? That can be our reaction, right? You can be, yeah! You mean you already died for me? Uh, yeah! And then I can go and do it now. I can do it. And you already forgiven me. I can do it. Or, you mean you've already died for all those sins? You already paid the price for all those sins? Wow, how can I ever sin against you anymore? What should be our reaction? And when we have a high quality of love, that is what it will result in. You look at the same action that Christ did. One will go and say, Yay, that's my reward. I can now sin. I can do whatever I want because that's the reward. Or the other one will be, Wow, that's what you did for me. Huh? Wow, your love is just so great. Your, your, your forgiveness is just so great. How can I ever take it for granted? How can I ever misuse it? And that, my friends, is what a high-quality love does. But you write me the last point in your notes is this, that a high-quality love makes pleasing Jesus your highest priority. It makes pleasing Jesus your highest priority priority. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He who does not love me does not keep my words. You see, true love means to do whatever a person asks you to do. Whatever that pleases that person, whatever that person desires, you just want to please him. That is what true love does. That's what the high quality love does. And that's what, you know, and that's the kind of love. You know, in English language, you don't have many understanding of Greek, of love. I mean, qualities of love. But in the Greek language, they have they have four qualities of love. The lowest is what we call eros, and that would be a sexual love, a love, a sexual kind of love. The other is what they call storge, a love between a mother and a child, a father and a son. Uh, the other one is what they call filio, a love between friends, between brothers. But the greatest of this, the highest quality of this, is what they call agape, a love, a sacrificial love, a love that basically says, not what I please, not what pleases me, not what I want. It doesn't matter because all that I want is to please you. That's all I ever want. And that's what an agape love means, a sacrificial love. I no longer have, I no longer have any say in it. 
I no longer have any opinion about it. I no longer have any, anything to do with it, any interest in it. It's all about you. And a high quality love is seen when we place Jesus, pleasing Jesus, as that highest priority. That highest priority. Not pleasing anyone else, not myself, not my mother, not my brother, not my father, not my sister, but pleasing Jesus as the highest priority. That's why Luke 14 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. <clears throat> That's the highest priority. You know, sometimes, <clears throat> when I think about it, I was reflecting over this, you know, sometimes I go back home and sometimes, you know, you, know, you want to, as a good husband, you want to please your wife. You want to do things for her so that she's happy and she's pleased. And when I reflect back over it, I realize, yeah, I want to please her. But then, that's not my highest priority. Because the reason I want to please her is so that she don't get angry with me and she don't make life miserable for me. And so in other words, my highest priority is not her, but it is me. But likewise, a true quality of love makes pleasing Jesus the highest priority. Not for yourself, not what rewards you can gain, not what punishment you can avoid, but just pleasing Jesus itself. I love Him no matter what, and I love Him because I just want to please Him. He pleased my Master because that is the greatest form of love. Why? Because He is worthy and He deserves it. I just want to close with this final point. How do we start loving God? How do we start increasing the quality of our love for God? 1 John 4 says this, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Or 1 John 14, verse 20, it says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. In other words, what the Bible is saying is that if we want to have a high quality of love for God, if we want to love God, we need to start by loving those around us. Start by loving those around you. You can't love God without loving those around you. And if you, and you want to increase your quality of love for God, then you start increasing your quality of love for those around you. And as you start loving them, you realize that your heart begins to love God more. And as you love God more, you'll find that your love for your brethren will also increase. It's a paradox, yes, but that's how it is. The more you love, your heart increases. The more your heart increases, the more you love. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And once again this morning, Lord, we ask for your Spirit to come and speak to us. For your Spirit to come and minister to us, Lord. Lord, forgive us for the many times when we have served you, when we have followed you for the wrong motives. For many times when fear has been our driving factor. Or for the times when the desire for rewards have been our driving factor. Lord, forgive us. This morning, Lord, we ask that you help make love the greatest motivation in our heart. The primary reason or the only reason we follow you let it be none other than love change our heart change our hearts in Jesus name we pray amen friends let's stand to our feet and as we close this series with a song that we that, that we've been dedicating our lives to every week let's sing this for one final time that is truly our prayer Lord it doesn't matter if my heart used to follow you in fear. It doesn't matter if I used to follow you because of rewards. 
But this morning, Lord, renew that heart. Renew that heart so that I will follow you for no other reason but love. Renew my heart, Lord Jesus. peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit continually change our hearts yes. and mold our hearts so that love becomes the greatest motivation Amen. in our hearts. Yes. Amen.